followed by Dr. Rachel. All right, it's Dr. Rachel. Welcome to the Balanced Beautiful Abundant Podcast. We're so excited to have you on the show today. Thanks so much. I'm so happy to be here, Rebecca. Yes, and I know you have such a busy practice, the number one doctor in Santa Cruz County, 11 years in a row during a pandemic. So thank you so much for sneaking home and getting this quick uh, conversation in amidst a pandemic where the world needs you more than ever. Oh, thank you. It's really my pleasure. And I feel like um, so much of what I have to offer is better offered to the public. So thank you for giving me the ability to do so. Yeah, well, I can't wait to get into all your knowledge. First, I want to tell my listeners how amazing and illustrious of a guest you are. So you graduated with honors from Stanford University. And Dr. Rachel has an MD from the University of San Francisco and a master's in holistic health from UC Berkeley. Dr. Rachel has authored five books and one audio book including Discover Your Body's Intelligence for Lifelong Health and Healing, Eight Dates, Essential Conversations for a Lifetime of Love, The Multi-Orgasmic Woman, Hello, and The Multi-Orgasmic Couple. So not only do you have an abundantly beautiful medical practice, you're also having a lot of orgasms, it sounds like. <laughs> Well, you know, there are certain things you can do during a pandemic to maintain your health and wellness, I'm just saying. You're balanced, beautiful, and abundant, just like the title <laughs> of the podcast. So uh, Dr. Rachel is the founder of the award-winning Santa Cruz Integrative Medical Clinic, where she has treated everyone from CEOs to billionaires to Nobel Prize winners. I mean, you are so knowledgeable and so well versed and we were talking before I hit record but what I love about your practice is that you're combining Chinese medicine with Western medicine so instead of just putting a band-aid on the problem which is Western medicine you're also getting into the causes and conditions that cause the problem and that's why I invited you to be the guest on the emotional component of the seven pillars of abundance. So we're going to talk into that right now. So we're living in times of great uncertainty. How does anxiety affect the body, especially the immune system? Yeah. Oh my God. Well, I mean, what's interesting about that question is that, um, it's so much more than living in a pandemic, which we are doing right now. But you know, you could argue that life um, in the United States and in many Western countries, though I think the United States is probably the worst of the, the Western countries, um, it has been an increased stressful and anxiety producing situation for decades um, for all people. Um, and obviously more, uh, some more than others, but uh, we are right now America's number one. Guess what we're number one in? Heart disease. <laughs> no, anxiety. Wow. Anxiety. So we are the most anxious nation on the planet. And I just want you to think about that for a minute, right? Can't you think of other countries that you think would be more stressful because yeah. of famine, war, political strife, dictatorship, poverty, right? No, most anxious nation on earth wow so how did we get why you know why are we the most anxious uh, nation on earth here's how i think about it and no one knows the answer to this question but this is my educated guess um which is this combination of wealth disparity which is becoming uh, a more prominent problem right now as it should yes. um we haven't had uh, such disparity between the haves and the and people who have less since before the 1920s. And it actually caused a tremendous amount of societal disruption. And it does all over the world when it exists. So more and more income inequality, um, very stressful for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and then also uh, the rise of technology. Mm -hmm. And maybe even more importantly than that, how we use technology. So I don't, I think technology itself is neutral. Um, but I think that how humans use technology, whether it is creating social media groups that 
target you with only the things you seem to be interested in and therefore fractionalize our society. Um, or the fact that young children are on social media many, many hours a day. And we know that there's a direct correlation between the amount of social media a young person is exposed to and the amount of depression and anxiety that they have. Wow. Um, it's a little more complex for adults because, I mean, COVID is a good example of this, but there are some adults who their social media um, is how they get most of their social interaction. And social interaction is really, really good for us most of the time, assuming that it is positive social interaction, um, which most of the time it is. Um, so for adults, getting some social interaction seems to be better. And if you're not comparing yourselves to people online, it can be a positive influence. So again, it's neutral. The way we use it is problematic. Um, and the fact that we gamify all of our social media to be addictive, you know, we're right. using all that we know from the gambling industry, from the cigarette and alcohol <laughs> industries to make social media addictive, to make it hook you, to make you want more, to keep you there and to make you buy things. So what mm -hmm. is it like when somebody gets a, a text or a social media notification? Is it an oxytocin hit? Is it an adrenaline what is it like biochemically that gets us so addictive where we constantly are checking, you know, we're like getting our fix all day long. Wanting that. Yes, exactly. What is it's, in the body? Is it just oxytocin or is it more? No, it's actually not oxytocin. It's dopamine. Um, okay. so, so oxytocin, you're right. We do get oxytocin from love and relationship. Yeah. So, well, you know, uh, I will say, let's say you're on, um, a Zoom call with your grandma who you yeah. love, right? You might get oxytocin then, right? right? You might get like, oh, love, calm, affection, adrenal, uh, you know, reducing response, lower cortisol, better immune function. But most of the time, if it's an Instagram post or it's a Snapchat post or it's Facebook or, you know, whatever your social media flavor is, um, it's a dopamine hit. Mm. A like is a dopamine hit. So dopamine is a very different chemical. Oxytocin, which is what we get from physical affection yeah. and real relationship and snuggling, whether it's with our romantic partner, with our family member, with our friends, or our dog for that matter. So you can I get, get a oxytocin. lot of oxytocin from my dog. <laughs> yeah, yeah, people do. So pets and animals, because they're, you know, most of them are mammals just like us. Um, we, we actually do get a lot of oxytocin hit, which is, again, really good physiologically for the human body um, from struggling with animals. But a, snap, a like on your Snapchat or a like on your uh, Instagram is different. It lights up dopamine in your brain. So dopamine gets lit up by a cigarette, by a hit of cocaine, by a shot of heroin, um, by winning, by competition and winning. It's a different chemical. And some dopamine, totally necessary, like all hormones and neurotransmitters. Um, it is uh, responsible for happy mood. Um, there's lots of good things about dopamine. But used in that way, like people who are addicted to sugar, when they eat a candy bar, they get a dopamine hit. And that's why sugar is addictive, as is fast food. Um, so that social media presence, because again, it's gamified, which is all about making it give you a dopamine rush. Right. Um, makes you want another. Oh, and I want another. Oh, and now I'm sad and I want another. So I'm going to get back on my phone or my computer or my pad or whatever uh, I'm using. So dopamine. Um, so, so your patients come in, you know, they're stressed, they're overwhelmed, they have adrenal depletion. How do you detox them or how do you wean them off dopamine and their addiction to checking their cell phone every five minutes? Do you have any advice for your patients? Yeah, and, and here's how I like to think about it. So it's easier to, to intuitively remember that we are living in these bodies that are 10,000 years old physiologically, right? Mm -hmm. So your and my response system, whether it's our hormones or it's our neurotransmitters, is very old, right? It's created to optimize human health at a time when we are outside most of the time, working hard together, food to provide shelter where we're living in close communities of between 90 and 150 people um, where we know everybody where there's a lot of affection um, and where what happens is happening at a pace where we're really knowing the the tragedies and the triumphs of 100 no more than 150 people right mm -hmm. that's a really different life than the one we're living 
Um, and also we're sleeping when it's dark outside, we're awake when it's light outside, we're physically active all day. So contrast that, so why are we anxious? So we talked about social media um, a little bit, we talked about uh, income inequity, but the fact that our physical lives have changed so dramatically that we're inside all day, we're under artificial light, we're sleeping way less, you know, the human body's made to sleep not, you know, eight to 10 hours a night. And, and on average in the US and in most uh, Western countries, it's six, six hours or six and a half hours. That has a profound impact on oh, yeah. physiology. It increases anxiety and increases depression. It decreases concentration. It decreases creativity. Um, it decreases it has immunity. I mean, if I don't get a full night sleep, I feel very vulnerable to colds and stuff, like right yeah. away. Yeah, and you're not alone in that. So, so, so when I think about how can we create a life that your body wants to live in? How can we create a life that your body loves so that it can function normally? It looks like this, more sleep, sleeping when it's dark, uh, being physical during the day, trying not to sit, sit, sit. You've probably seen some of those studies on sitting as the new smoking. I mean, it's fascinating. No, I didn't know that. I didn't know okay. that. I heard that 5G and not turning your cell phone to airplane mode was the new smoking. I didn't know it was. <laughs> yeah, so what's really fascinating about that is that um, even if you exercise, so let's say you have a nine to five job and you're sitting in front of your computer all day long, but then you're really careful and you believe in your health. So you go to the gym, you know, three or four days a week after that and you work out for an hour you still will have worse health than someone who is standing and walking all day because sitting is actually harmful too much of it is actually harmful isn't that interesting that is good to know i don't i didn't mean to interrupt you were saying the thing no, not at all not at all so so the things that so getting back in touch with our physiology sleeping enough being active during the day you could be at a standing desk you could be on a ball where you're moving you could do your next uh phone meeting while walking. You could do it while you're walking around your yard. You know, there's lots of ways to keep our bodies kind of active while we're working. Very important. Um, and then eating. I know I'm sure you talk about this a lot, but um, eating what we're used to, which is a very high fiber, low uh, amount, a little, bit of high, a little bit of high quality animal protein, but not a lot lots of fruits and vegetables, and not very much in general, low calories, um, and fat primarily from vegetable sources, and not a ton of that either. So a clean diet, and what I just described is really whether you are vegan, paleo, you know, whatever your flavor of diet, I'm not a huge believer in strict diets of any kind, uh, but whatever your flavor of diet, nobody's gonna disagree about both many of those things fiber, lots of fruits and vegetables. Everybody agrees about that. Um, and those are the things that are well studied to produce health. So we talked about moving a lot, sleeping a lot, eating beautifully, love and relationship, which is you and I want to focus a bit on uh, emotions today, because it turns out that of all these things I'm talking about, these fundamentals of health, love and relationship is the most powerful. It makes the biggest difference. It has the, it's more important than how you eat. It's more important than whether you exercise. People have a hard time getting this through their heads, but love and relationship is huge. Um, and when we're talking about anxiety, um, I had the privilege of talking to the previous head of the National Institute for Mental Health, mm -hmm. and he was responsible for channeling millions and millions and millions of dollars into research for drug treatment for anxiety and depression. And he basically said, it's a failure. And wow. that's not to say I don't sometimes prescribe antidepressants because I do, um, but do they address an entire society's risk for anxiety and depression? Not even close. First of all, they don't work that well. And secondly, they're just inadequate for a society that's suffering from a lack of social interaction. So this is the and other they deplete your ability to have multiple orgasms. So that's <laughs> not anything you teach either. <laughs> They desensitize you everywhere. That's so true, Rebecca. I mean, who wants to take drugs that decrease your sexual enjoyment? I mean, come on. How can that be good for you? So, um, so, so the, the social part, the human-to-human -human interaction, and the living, you know, how anxiety has also gone like this, and depression in our society. 
And if you think about what was different, you know, we lived in smaller communities and more tighter knit and we knew more of our neighbors. That's research based, not just me speaking uh, fondly of the past, but you know, people knew their neighbors more, they trusted their neighbors more, no matter where they lived. And those feelings have a huge impact on your general sense of safety, which is related to anxiety. I say in my book, community builds immunity. 100%. 100%. And right now, there's been so much um, like suicide and people going to psychological institutions because they feel alone. They're not getting the community that they normally get in person. So what advice do you have for the people that are single, that don't have pets, that are still in social isolation? They're, they're feeling more anxiety and more depression because they don't have the people around them to give them hugs. I know hugs change you on a biochemical level too. What advice can you give the people that are feeling isolated? And do you mean specifically during the pandemic? Yes. Or you just during, well, I think in general because, yeah, I think that technology has created a, um, a high-tech, low-touch society where people are lost in the worlds of cyberspace and they don't go out and they interact. I would say in general, if someone was feeling isolated and alone, but especially during the pandemic where they can't you know, go to a picnic or a party or a park or go, you know, play a sport on a sports team. What, how would you tell them to help? What would you tell them to stay uh, connected so they don't get more anxious? Well, I mean, it's a really interesting question. And I think just another illustration about how technology is neutral. Mm -hmm. So can you imagine this pandemic without it? Exactly. Can it would you be way more isolating? we wouldn't be able to function as educational institutions or governmental institutions or court systems. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's been um, technology at this moment has been life-saving in a whole bunch of ways. And I'm not arguing for more technology in general. I, but I am saying that I think technology um, at least offers participation for folks. So one thing I have found really helpful <laughs> Can we pause for just a moment and edit right here? I've got uh, I've got noise interference going on here. I'm gonna be um, right okay. I'll pause. So, so I actually think that um, technology in in many many ways is saving people's lives during COVID. I'm not saying it's the same as human to human interaction. But the alternative would be total isolation. People in their houses with their television and that's about it. So the fact that we can have human to human interaction, thank God. Mm -hmm. um, and for those folks who haven't tried it, there's a lot to be said for group interaction on you know, whatever video platform you like to use. There's a whole bunch of them. But um, I think that um, the hangouts that are happening online with groups of people are really helping. Um, because That's how we met. Because <laughs> how we met, exactly. We childhood best friends, and we had <laughs> a video uh, Zoom hangout call. Yeah, yeah. So, so they work. Yes, I agree. And especially um, at this moment in history, when we're beginning to open up a little more, there's also something to be said for being outside with other people, whether you're interacting with them or not. Even if you're staying six feet away, at least feeling like, ah, you know, we're all out together. We're part of a community. We're walking in the same place, whether it's the woods or the sidewalks or the beaches or the city blocks, you know, there, I think it's, I think both things are really important. Seeing other humans getting outside. So this is another huge thing um, and something that is available to people during COVID. The only time it's really um, impossible and challenging is if you live in an inner city and you don't have access to nature. Mm -hmm. um, many cities do have uh, access to nature, but not all. Yeah. Um, so if you don't have access, this is a hard thing. But um, but getting outside and being in sunshine for vitamin D, which also helps with anxiety and depression, um, and actually just even seeing a plant, it can be simple. It could be a tree on your street, has this really remarkable impact on lowering your cortisol levels mm. and helping with tissue buildup rather than breakdown and improving your immunity. Um, there was this great study that if you lived in an apartment in a city and out your window, you could see one tree, 
that it had a dramatic impact on your risk of depression. And this is controlling for the same neighborhood, same yeah. neighborhood, but you could see a tree as opposed to not seeing a tree. Huge difference in terms of your well being, your, your emotional well being, and risk of depression and illness. Um, and the other thing that I think is important as we talk about this is that, as you've said, community is immunity. 100% agree with you, and there's plenty of research to back that up. You're far less at risk for all things related to immunity, like getting sick, COVID, for example, viral illnesses, cancer. Um, when you're in community with other people, you're also less at risk for heart disease. Um, and the same can be true for nature, mm. all of those same things. Um, it really has a dramatic effect on the human organism, which makes sense, right? Because we're made to be outside with the rest of the natural world. And when we are, it helps us, again, be in alignment with our own physiology. So I would say more group hangouts on some kind of video platform so you feel like you're not alone. Getting outside where there are other people, even if you're social distancing, because just being around other humans makes you feel normal. Certainly cuddling with any animals that are in your life, very helpful. And then getting into nature is huge, absolutely huge. And it doesn't have something not made with human hands. 100%, 100%. And you know, whether it's a beautiful desert where you live or it's a forest or it's Central Park, you know, any kind of nature, very helpful uh, for people as we get through COVID. And we don't know, but I'm really praying that as we open up, we don't get another big surge and end up isolated again, that we get this slow titration mm. uh, into normality and we start to be uh, interacting safely with each other again, even if it's not in large groups. So how much does mindset help your immunity? If you're like constantly affirming that I am enjoying perfect health, I have a strong immune system, I'm healthy and vital, and you're still taking the precautions, does it, does it boost your immune system to speak in affirmations and to some people I know that are spiritual won't even say the word COVID or pandemic. They're like, I don't even want my cells to hear it. I just want to stay super positive. Like they're calling this, um, a reinvention, like a planet Earth, a rebirthing rather than a pandemic, because they don't want to look at the negative. So, how much of that, as a scientist and a medical doctor, is airy fairy, and how much of it do you think is relevant? Um, I love this question. I do practice in Santa Cruz, California. I want to point yeah. out. So, for those of you who are not familiar with it, it is about the most liberal. Uh, you know, when you say the word airy fairy, like this is the, this is the water I swim in on a regular basis. Um, I would say a couple things about it. I feel like if you are having to make an effort not to say the word COVID all the time and to substitute it with something else, that that's actually acting out fear. Mm. Um, I'm not sure if that's helpful. That sounds like a lot of psychological work not to say a word which is creating a fear pattern that you can't say it or if you do it might do, do something bad to you that's probably bad for you yeah so I, I don't find that very helpful i'm fine with trying to speak in constructive terms mm -hmm. but part of what makes me completely crazy about that community is the denial of the shadow and of pain mm -hmm. and this is a painful time there is a lot of grief to be had, whether it is about uh, wealth disparity or racial inequality or people dying, more than 100,000 in our country and, and counting. Mm -hmm. um, this is a time of collective grief. And if you are avoiding the negative, well, then you're just burying it down inside of yourself. And what does that do? Make you sick. You know, I think that I think that moving through grief and finding integration is essential for well being. I am not a fan of all the light and none of the dark because that shit doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. It's not life, it's not real life. So I think integration is important. Um, and then the question of do affirmations improve health? Well, that depends on how you do your information, who you are, and the impact it has on your physiology, mm -hmm. you know? Like if you are, let's say you're a deep uh, meditator and in your meditative state in the morning, you really have a calm physiology, low cortisol. And in that state, you, 
you know, repeat to yourself, you know, may I serve, may I, may I serve in the way I'm called today or something like this, or like Oprah Winfrey says, you know, use me mm -hmm. to the universe. Does that have a positive impact? Yeah, it probably does. Just like prayer or, um, uh, you know, any sort of positive spiritual uh, outlook. But does just saying something happy make you well? It really depends on what else is going on in you. You know, I think that each of us is a, is a whole panoply of little people on the inside with a variety of different, different um, expressions and personalities. And that real growth is about being integrated so that you're not denying any of them. Including like Inside the Out, like the movie Inside Out. Just like Inside Out. Just, yes, I love that movie. So we all have an asshole, okay? And we all have a whiner and we all, you know, we all have all these aspects of self. Right. So in my mind, real health and wholeness is acknowledging each of those. And if you are acknowledging each of those, but from that place of wholeness, trying to, you know, intend to go somewhere, I, I think that's great. I think that's great. But just a, a caveat that, somehow avoiding saying a word or repeating a positive phrase over and over again is going to heal you or protect you? Not so much. So I was telling you before we hit record that I recently had my gallbladder removed and I, you know, I think I was doing exactly what you just said not to do. I was like, oh, I'm not going to feel any of my anger and I'm just going to love everybody and I'm not going <laughs> to my sad grief. I'm just going to like affirm and pray and meditate and go work out. And, and then all of a sudden I have to have an organ yanked out because I had dis-ease in my body. So I know you are going to tell me more about how the gallbladder is discussed in Chinese medicine and, and what its roles are with the emotions. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, Chinese medicine, I use a whole bunch of different ways of thinking about the body. So Chinese medicine is a beloved one um, that I use, but I'm also interested and familiar with Western herbal traditions and South American herbal traditions and wow. medicine, a whole, I bring a whole, a whole, like all practitioners, I bring a whole bunch of things to bear when I'm in the room with someone, including my own personal experience. Mm -hmm. So the gallbladder in Western medicine is there to hold bile, which is comes from the liver and is necessary for digestion. What it does is separate out the fats so that they can be properly um, digested by digestive enzymes and absorbed. And fats hold a lot of really important nutrients, including vitamins like vitamin D, vitamin A, vitamin K. Um, in Chinese medicine, I am not a, uh, a Chinese medicine practitioner, so please forgive me if you are. Um, but the gallbladder is one of the major channels and energy channels. So it's not just where the gallbladder is, which is on your right side below your rib cage. It's the entire uh, meridian, which goes down your leg and into your foot and then up your body and into your head and actually over into your eye. So this is gallbladder channel. Um, and uh, I have to admit to not being completely familiar with all the different meanings uh, of that channel. Um, yeah. I'm, more, I'm more familiar with liver from a five element uh, point of view, which is about anger um, mm -hmm. and kindness, by the way. So there's always a yin and a yang emotion and a positive and negative emotion. So the liver itself is, uh, is anger. And interestingly, <laughs> I always find it hilarious when I've been working with acupuncturists for the last 12 years, side by side. So many of my patients see me and see the acupuncturist. Oh, right. um, and uh, at least 80% of the people that I see who use Chinese medicine say, oh my gosh, I have liver congestion. And I'm always like, mm -hmm. welcome to the modern world. Welcome to living in the United States. You have liver congestion. You know, it's yeah. a, it's a, it is a, uh, and again, Chinese medicine developed in Chinese society over thousands of years. So is there something off in our current culture? 100%. You know, and it produces liver congestion. And does some of that have to, and, and regulation of stress in the body is the other role of the liver. So do we have trouble with stress regulation and anger? 100%, right? That's part of, uh, it's part of our cultural legacy is what I want to say. And I think- how, how do you express your anger without wallowing in it? So it doesn't stay in your body, but also so you don't become 
you know, dysregulated with your emotions? Like how, how do you move through the dark side? Yeah. So this is such a good question. And, um, I was thinking about emotions because I knew we were going to talk about it. And depending on the research you look at, there are either five ba basic emotions or four basic emotions, mm -hmm. um, two different theories of very smart people. Um, and the positive emotion is joy. Mm -hmm. And all the positive emotions <laughs> seem to go into that category. And then the negative emotions are anger and sadness and fear. And those three are distinct physiologically in the body. And what is fascinating to me about emotion is that the experience of an emotion, which is a hormonal neurochemical experience in the body, um, is that an emotion comes over you. And by the way, they just wash over us. There's not, there is no human animal that doesn't experience uh, emotion. Now, some people are more highly sensitive to emotion. Some people are less highly sensitive to emotion. That has to do with a whole bunch of things, um, including your, 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 you know, whether you are neurotypical or neurodifferent in terms of brain processing, um, but also uh, early experience. Um, some people, like the entire class of males uh, in our society, are taught to tamp down emotion so they don't have necessarily as much access to it. It doesn't mean that you don't feel it, but you may not be aware of it. Mm -hmm. So we all are awash in these physiologic changes that have to do with those four basic emotions all the time. But the physiologic experience of the emotion literally lasts for 90 seconds. Wow. 90 seconds. That's it. Right? It's not that long. Just your mind replaying it over and over and over again <laughs> in your head on a loop. Yes. Yes. So when because... you replay it on a loop, does your body physiologically feel it again for 90 seconds? Yeah. You can continue to feel fear or for the last three months continuously. Yeah. Because your mind is watching the news and your mind is terrified because you had a, one of my patients had an early experience of losing her sister to a viral illness. And so she's got PTSD type symptoms going on right now. So we have these giant forebrains that are able to project into the future and reflect back into the past and create stories that keep our emotions alive for longer. So one of the things that I like to at least try to be conscious of is, let's say I'm in a really negative, I'm, in in, I'm in a giant wave of sadness mm -hmm. for, for one of many reasons. Yeah. That I can actually be in it. So if you never, if you resist it, which is part of the reasons I don't like not saying words, um, if you resist it, it will, pers what you resist will persist. Right. You resist the emotion, it will stay with you longer. Um, and you may not be uh, immediately conscious of it, but it's underneath all the words you're saying and the tone of your voice and your experience of your life. Mm -hmm. um, but if you don't resist it, and this is what I mean by proper grieving. You know, we're living in a time in which there is a lot of necessary grief mm -hmm. that needs to happen, sadness. Um, and if you don't let it come over you, feel those feelings that might include tears or that might include shaking or it might just include rolling yourself into a ball or it might be easier if somebody holds you. But if you don't completely experience it, you can't move through it mm -hmm. and often, you know, being physical, like not sitting, you know, staunchly straight, but either, you know, curling into the emotion or moving in a way that moves that emotion through. If it's anxiety, anxiety is a, is a energetic emotion. It's a high life energy emotion. It usually requires movement of some kind, mm -hmm. but that anxiety comes through. If you can, you know, stamp the floor, run around in a circle and let it move through you and out, you don't have to stay in it. Now, not staying in it is a practice, sort of like meditation. <laughs> it's, not, it's not something that's natural to us, and it's not something that's simple, but it is possible. So if we know it's possible, and we let ourselves feel the emotion, and then allow it to go as we can, and become aware of the attachments that keep it with us, whether that's uh, earlier trauma, or injury, or or anybody who hasn't properly grieved, hasn't grieved enough for a loss of someone they loved, including a pet, will get a replay of that with the right. next loss. So I think there's something to be said. And our society does not do well with grief. 
-hmm. and does not do well with death. Yes. And there's a lot of both of those going on right now. Mm -hmm. And we need more tolerance for talking about it, for feeling it, for have, for it being really okay to have periods of melancholy. There's nothing wrong with melancholy. It's an emotion. It's a normal human experience. If you look at, um, you know, writings from many other cultures or even just European cultures, melancholy was, was an accepted part of life. Um, partly because people died all the time before 150 years ago, death was a common part of every single family. You know, there was no avoiding it. Right. And it happened in your home. And we've now somehow created this plastic world where death happens inside a hospital room. It's a total denial of death. And I know that you and your husband have, you know, had a lot of conversations with the Dalai Lama. One of the things that Buddhists meditate on is death. They meditate on impermanence. Yeah. And it gives you a lot of freedom knowing yeah. that the experience that we're in is going to end. Yeah. There's yeah. a lot of freedom, but I agree. People, people in this culture, they're youth obsessed and they don't want to talk about death. And we need to. We need to. So I am down to uh, my last question. Um, there's so many that I want to get to. You're going to have to come back. Dr. <laughs> I'm like, I have four more questions and I don't know which one to talk about first, but okay. What are some of the um, ways someone can protect themselves physiologically against a negative person? So people are home with their spouses, people are home with roommates, I'm sure you know about the water molecule study, um, Masuro Emoto, when he spoke negatively to the water, it affected it on a negative, molecularly, uh, a negative way. And when he spoke positively to the water, the water you know, became crystallized and beautiful. So if someone is at home with someone who's constantly criticizing verbally or God forbid, physically abusing them, how can they stay healthy? Yeah. What are some tips? Well, there's a lot of research on the impact of relationship. Um, and you probably know that being in a negative primary relationship, like with a, a spouse, has a huge impact on health. It has a huge impact on your physiology, increased risk of heart disease, cancer, um, viral illness, decreased immunity, increased depression, increased anxiety, increased suicidality. So massive. Um, by the way, being in a positive relationship has a dramatically positive influence on health. So both of those things are true. Um, those things are more true for women, mm -hmm. by which I mean, if you look at the data in general, a single woman, just all data, all marriages, good and bad, all, a single woman is more healthy than a married woman. Mm -hmm. But a woman in a really good marriage is more healthy than a single woman. And a woman in a bad marriage is way less healthy. Mm. Okay. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. so, so the intensity of the relationship seems to have, and men who are married, good or bad relationship are all healthier than single men. Mm. So, and if you're in a female, female marriage or a male, male marriage, it is absolutely still true, good research showing that being in a good relationship, again, has very positive health effects. Being in a bad relationship has really negative health effects, regardless of gender. Um, so if you are in a negative relationship, you have to get as much physical or mental space as you can from that person. Mm. Um, I think it would be fair to say, and I work with John and Julie Gottman and love their work, um, and I think it's... Um, Unless you're in a constructive argument where anger is present, but you still feel like, yeah, I may feel afraid, but this is good. We're going somewhere. We're going to come to a conclusion. We're going to find a place where we come together. Nothing wrong with that. Everybody gets angry. Every couple, dis every couple without exception, disagrees about things and has to work them out. That's part of why marriage makes you a better person or relationship makes you a better person. That said, if you're in an interaction when someone has blown their top. You know, Dan Siegel talks about when you've lost your reason and you're out of the forebrain and you've dropped into the brainstem, you're just in a fear reaction. Well, then you're just, you know, blurting out 
angry, mean, harmful words uh, and tone and stance, right? It's a whole thing. It's not just what we say, it's how we say it. Yeah. If you are at that place where there's that much upset, or you could even say, you know, sadness and fear where one person is crumpled and now physically and, and physiologically removed from the conversation because they feel so challenged, it needs to stop. It's not good for anybody. So right. if you're in that situation where there is what feels like verbal abuse or um, anger or, or that kind of withdrawal, the interaction needs to stop because it is actually terrible for everyone involved. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously if there is physical abuse ever. Yeah. So getting distance to whatever degree you can, now that can include I'm in a studio apartment, but I'm in the corner with a headset on facing away from this person looking at a screen, that's important. Now, obviously anybody who's physically threatened may need to leave yeah. um, and shelters are open uh, for domestic violence because unfortunately one of the uh, outcomes of us being inside with each other is more domestic violence uh, during the pandemic. So in whatever ways we need to take care of ourselves, whether exiting the premises because the risk of COVID is less than the risk of violence in the relationship yeah. or getting physical dis and emotional distance in whatever way you can. You can actually, in a functional relationship, even in a small space, you can still get distance from somebody. Um, getting verbal distance tends to be the challenge for folks these days. So I find um, making people do whatever they're doing with a headset on. Yeah. Whether it's listening to something, you know, whether it's a, a an audio book or you're watching a television show or whatever's going on. Um, and being on phone calls outside is really helpful so that you give each other verbal space. I live in a, a not very big house. We have six adults here right now. I have three grown children and an adopted one. And um, we are, you know, in always negotiating space. We're using the garage. We're using the outside space. We're using all the bedrooms. That's what happened during this podcast, right? We had right, to exactly. Negotiate space. So, well, I love that. That's great. Find space energetically, emotionally, physically. Go for a walk. Go stay with a friend for a few days. Like, do whatever you can. We're going to wrap up the podcast. I love talking to you, Dr. Rachel. I know where I'm going if I have any medical issues. I'm <laughs> going to 5 North and I'm going to Santa Cruz to your health institute. So how can people stay in touch with you? Thank you so much for asking. So my uh, site is drrachel.com. That's all spelled out. D-O-C-T-O-R, Rachel, R-A-C-H-E-L.com. Um, and then that'll also link to my clinic site if you're interested in being seen as a patient. And I've got a lot of books and videos and I've got an online course. So anything you're interested in, be so happy to interact and hear from you. And all the books and everything are on your website? They are. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. I learned so much. I cannot wait to talk to you again. <laughs> person. Next time, thank you so much for being on the show. And for my wonderful listeners, if this message helps you, please share it with someone else that you think it may benefit. We want to spread these great tips and tools of staying healthy and vital during the pandemic and beyond because these are great health tips. So please share the podcast if you found it helpful. And I know you did. So thank you for tuning in to Balance Beautiful Abundant. And we'll see you next week with another amazing guest. Thanks, Dr. Rachel. Thank you.